So today we begin Colossians, and I'm thankful for what all we learned in Galatians, and we will just march forward here through the scriptures, verse by verse by verse, and apply these things to our lives. So let me read the text and pray. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you have previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for caring about us, for showing us how important prayer and the truth and the gospel and fellowship and the saints are. Thank you for preserving your word for us in Scripture. Thank you for the book of Colossians, and I pray that over the weeks as we have gracious opportunity to open up these passages together, that your word would be taught with clarity, authority, without compromise, and may your word be interpreted according to the intent of the Holy Spirit-inspired author. To that, we ask grace, focus, in clarity, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to start by just laying out geographically where we are talking about Colossae. We have the um, Lycus River Valley, and you may notice on the, the top slide the names of some of the churches in the book of Revelation. As Eric's been teaching through Revelation, he's dealt with some messages to churches. You see some of them. You see Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Ephesus, and so on. So this is the same part here of Asia Minor. Pisidian Antioch was the key place that you read about in the book of Acts. And Colossae, which was in the same area, and part of a region called uh, Phrygia, and was part of the Roman province of Asia. This was a very important area because of the mobility, uh, the mixing of various ethnic groups, including Jews and Gentiles. And so the people who made up the Colossian church were diverse as well. And the majority may very well have been Gentile, but there was a Jewish presence there and Jewish influence in the area going back some years before this particular time. And there was a major highway that went there, many religious, philosophical, and so on viewpoints thrived and mixed together. But without further discussion of this, I want to get right into the text itself. I'm itching to preach Colossians. In fact, I'm excited to preach Colossians. I love this book, and I love the message of it, and I think it's pertinent for us in our day. Colossians 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now, I concur with what was said in Sunday school if you want to get much more detail about the occasion of the prison epistles, you can listen to Adam's Sunday school this morning. It was very well done. Paul was called and appointed by Jesus Christ himself. Paul was an authoritative apostle. Eric and I, and Adam for that matter, those who teach you, we do believe that under the new covenant, the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles are binding 
on the hearts, minds, lives, and consciences of Christians. Paul and the other apostles and Jesus Christ himself spoke for God authoritatively, inerrantly, and bindingly. What does this mean? That means what they bind us to, we're bound to. What, what they lose, which means permit, is then a matter of freedom. We need to know the difference. That's what it means to have apostolic authority. Paul has that authority, and he was appointed by God and sent. An apostle is a sent one, and he was sent with binding authority. It says in Ephesians 2 and verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, himself being the cornerstone. So here is your authority, Ephesians 2.20. There are people today who make grandiose claims and go about the country saying they are the apostles of God and they have to listen to them. Some say there are thousands. One guy claimed there's twenty to 50,000 apostles right now. And we're denying that and we're saying that unless those modern self-proclaimed apostles are teaching exactly what's the implications and applications of the teachings of the Christ and his apostles, we can safely ignore them. In fact, if they're teaching here, we can rebuke them and tell them to be silent in the church. And their curses will do you no harm. I've been cursed by apostles and prophets, by the way, more than once since the early 1980s. In this passage, Timothy was Paul's associate, but not an apostle in the same sense that Paul was. There are times when the term sent one, or even the term prophet, is used in a functional sense, but not a technical sense. So here we want to identify the technical sense of the authoritative apostles and prophets who speak for God. They're biblical ones. And so, how was it that Paul was an apostle by the will of God? He's in Roman prison. I concur with what Adam said, that this happened. You can read about it at the end of Acts. And from here, he wrote the prison epistles of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. And Colossians is one of those. One of the things that Paul consistently prayed for was that he could speak forth the mystery of Christ. In Colossians 4, 3, Paul said, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word. You see that prayer, by the way, similarly in Ephesians, in Ephesians 6. So that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison. Paul made it very clear that in his imprisonment, People were coming and going. Philippians, we find out that the gospel became known throughout the Praetorian Guard and that God used this to spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. Colossians 1 and verse 2. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Though mostly unknown to Paul, he had not personally met the members of the church in Colossae. Uh, they, because they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, are brothers, saints and faithful brothers in Christ. And so these are the same people. There's a term in language study is called appositional. Appositional means uh, Christ, even the Savior. In other words, both things are saying Christ and Savior, the same person. The, same, the saints the fa and the faithful brethren in Christ are the same people. They are the church. In Christ here means within the sphere of Christ and Paul preached we know elsewhere the gospel of peace. 
as I'm reading through Colossians yet again, I've studied it before, as I'm thinking about the themes of Colossians, you begin to realize that basic truths that one finds throughout the New Testament are amazingly important, profound, and powerful. And what a mistake it is we make when, we, when these things start weighing too lightly upon us. Things like prayer. Things like sharing the gospel with the lost. Things like greeting one another with greetings such as grace and peace from God. The, the importance of the dear family of God to each of us and how we should care for one another. In Acts 20 and verse 24, we have Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders, and he says this, But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. We chose the name Gospel of Grace Fellowship for our fellowship because we love the gospel of grace. And this is what Paul called it, not what we just made up. And so this also has to do with peace. Grace is a modification here in this greeting of a common Greek greeting, karin, but here modified to grace by Paul. And peace would be calling to mind the Hebrew greeting, shalom. So he's greeting people in a way to remind them of the great blessing that they have to know God. Colossians 1.3 we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now remember, Paul had never been to Colossae. He was imprisoned in Rome. He hadn't met most everyone in this particular church. But knowing that Epaphras had come there with the gospel and God used it to found a church, I'll talk about that next week, Paul in prison is praying. Imagine the heavy burdens of prayer that rested upon the shoulders of Apostle Paul. He said later that he had the burdens for all the churches. He, excuse me, he had the burdens of all the churches. He cared about people. He cared that they would be faithful in the gospel. He cared that they would grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. He cared about their well-being because he realized that when people such as in Colossae came to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior through the gospel, they were immediately at odds with everyone around them. They were likely to lose their businesses. They were likely to lose their family and their friends. They were likely to be hated and ostracized. And the pressure to apostatize or to leave the faith was great because by doing so, one could get rid of all of the negative things that happened because of coming to Christ through the gospel. Knowing this, and with a heavy heart and yet a rejoicing at the same time, this apostle, Paul, prayed for the saints in the churches and prayed for them without ceasing. It's amazing how important prayer is in the New Testament. It's a means of grace, according to Acts 2.42, and elsewhere. We need to pray for one another. We need to care for one another. We need one another. And it's not just in the ancient world that people lose their friends and families when they come to Christ. People become ostracized and they really don't have anybody but the church. But how sweet is that fellowship? So he prayed for them. This is corporate prayer and thanksgiving. Timothy and others joined Paul as he was in prison and people came and 
went from Paul in prison, and they prayed. They prayed for the church. They prayed for one another. And I thank God for that blessed privilege. Verse 4 and 5a. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. And so by highlighting in red, you can see this triad of faith, hope, and love, which are highlighted elsewhere in the New Testament. These are three supreme virtues, blessings, characteristics of Christian faith and Christian experience. Faith in Christ, love for the saints, hope in heaven. That's something that we all have if we have genuine faith. Faith in Christ includes the idea of Christ as the object of faith and the idea of being in the sphere of Christ, which, by the way, comes from the Greek and the data of here and what have you. I won't uh, burden you with any more than saying that, but it's important, and we become totally different people. Is that true? Am, am I just being melodramatic, or are we totally changed when we come to Christ? Is, is the change so dramatic that those who know us can tell that it happened? I believe that that is the case, especially when rebels like me or like I was came to Christ. Everybody knew about it. And it changed everything. It changed friendships. It changed relationships. It changed how we believe. It changes what's important to us. And it changes how we live. Faith, hope, and love. Love is very much characteristic of Christians. And we have hope in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. We have hope in heaven. If you look at some of the old gospel music from the early 20th century, one of the things that's striking about it is how much they sang about heaven. And I remember when I was a new Christian and I went to these little churches and to Bible college, we were always singing about heaven. And sometimes back in the 80s, some very, uh, how would you say it, wise in their own eyes, people came along and defied, decided, excuse me, that singing about heaven constituted being a miserable failure and that we should have uh, health and prosperity theology and we should not even think about heaven. We only think about taking dominion now and that we have everything in the here and now rather than looking to heaven which they thought was something worth mocking. My dear friends, I know this is not true about you, don't mock people who have hope in heaven. Isn't that really bad? When, when people are rejected by the world and they've turned from sin and Satan and darkness and come into the light of God, they have hope laid up in heaven. This is what Christians are like. It's not right that they're mocked by these geniuses who think they know better. There's an eternal reward awaiting the Christian. One of the themes in Colossians that we'll see as we go on is a magnificent material about the person of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, and the supremacy of Christ. And here we have an introduction to that, that they have faith in Christ Jesus. Paul is going to give a full-orbed declaration of the great and magnificent person and work of Jesus Christ. 
And that should be something that invokes in us a wonder and awe and excitement. This, the Christ whom we serve is great and glorious. Colossians 1, 5b. I'm going to come back to this one next week because it just as well will introduce the next section. It says here, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, comma, the gospel. Here we have appositional again. The word of truth, which actually is the gospel. There's an awful lot of ways the term for the gospel are found in the New Testament. It's good news. It's the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, the gospel of Christ, preaching Christ, preaching the gospel, the word of the cross, the word of truth. All of these are describing the one and same gospel. There's not three or four or five or six gospels. There's one true one and all the rest are false. So when we preach Christ or we preach the cross or we preach the word of truth or we preach the gospel of grace, we're preaching the gospel. And we cannot be too gospel-centric. Evangelion, the message of good news. And the gospel that we preach centers about the person and work of Christ. As we go into Colossians in more detail, we'll see that the sufficiency of Christ is the answer to the fears of the people of Colossae. They feared demons. They feared poverty. They feared bad faith. They feared that they were under the stoichia or the hostile powers, as a Greek word. But this we have in contrast to the truth of the gospel, which delivers us from all of those fears. The gospel is God's proclamation of truth. Eric and I here at Gospel of Grace Fellowship preach the gospel. We discuss the person of Christ in that context, and we discuss also what the bad news is, what repentance is, what faith is, and the resulting salvation. What about the person of Christ? The gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ, meaning that he's the object of our preaching and also the one from whence the gospel came. Paul, remember, said, I received of the Lord Jesus that which I delivered to you. When we preach Christ, we give details. I know some have said, well, you keep saying the same thing. Christ existed from all eternity as God and with God, and he created the whole universe. Yeah, that's true. I keep saying that. Why? Because the average person in America would hear Jesus Christ and think, well, he's the founder of a world religion. He's like Buddha, or he's like Muhammad, or he's like Joseph Smith, or he's like somebody else that started a religion that influenced a lot of people. We're not saying that. We're not saying that Jesus is an ordinary guy, and we're not saying he's a man who ascended to godhood, as the Mormons say. The Bible claims that Jesus is uniquely God who becomes man. Not man, as Mormonism says, who become gods, little gods. Jesus Christ is the creator. It says that in John 1 and in Hebrews 1. He enjoyed perfect and full fellowship with the Father, face to face with the Father, according to John 1.1. 1, 1. Jesus was sent into this world by God and was born of the Virgin Mary. This is something that Christians believe, and it's true, and it's biblical. The virgin birth 
is biblical. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. He obeyed God's law perfectly where we failed and sinned. Jesus Christ made many claims. He did many miracles. One of the most glorious things that we have in the Gospels about Jesus is that he predicted his own resurrection from the dead. He said, tear this down, tear down this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. This, it says in John, he spoke of his temple, the body. And when they were accusing him before the religious and civil authorities, they said he made that claim, and they used that against him as a blasphemer and a sorcerer. So even Jesus' critics claimed that he really did predict his own resurrection from the dead. I believe in a literal bodily resurrection, that Jesus was literally bodily raised from the dead and that he appeared to many witnesses and that he bodily ascended to heaven and I believe, and I believe the claims of the New Testament are grounded in cold, so, sober history, not just religious myth. Now, that's who Jesus is, but we need to ask ourselves, why do we need him? And we might think, I don't need to be religious. I'm happy going about life with minimal intrusion by thoughts of guilt or religion or what have you. Well, let me explain why we need Christ. The Bible says clearly that the wrath of God abides upon those who are the sons or those characterized by disobedience. We've sinned against God. We've broken his law. God is a God of justice. And it's true that his justice fell upon his own son so that those who believe can escape from the wrath of God against sin. This is central to the New Testament claim about the gospel. You find it in Romans 5, you find it in Ephesians 2, and you find it in many other places. And therefore, the bad news is God's wrath against sin. The good news is that Christ bore it for us if we believe. Let me read to you. Some of you have open Bibles if you want to turn to this and just think about how Paul shared the gospel to King Agrippa. I mean, it's really quite amazing. You know, we were talking about the prison epistles. How was it Paul ended up in prison? Well, this will help us understand. Look at what he said to the king. He didn't say, well, you know, ordinary people have the wrath of God revealed against their sin, but you, king, you're different. You're important. He didn't do that. Acts 26, 18. Acts 26 and verse 18. Paul describing the call from the heavenly vision that he got directly from Jesus Christ. Look at this. What is Paul to do? Well, Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. There's a lot of theology in that one verse. And Paul preached it to a king. Can you imagine that? This guy can say off with his head. But Paul had appealed to Rome. Verse 19, so King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. So what did he do? He preached that we turn from darkness to light. There's repentance from the dominion of Satan to God. The implication, we were under Satan's dominion, and we need to come to God. That we may receive forgiveness of sins. What's the implication? That we were sinners and we had our own guilt, and only Christ can remove it. And that there's a heavenly reward, which we 
saw in here in Colossians. Verse 20. One more verse here. But kept declaring both of those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance, meaning their lives are changed and now they're serving God on his terms. Isn't that amazing to preach that to a king? Wow! The gospel is for everyone. It's in contrast to false teaching and it gives eternal hope. Here's the gospel laid out. The gospel of grace. What about you today? Repent and believe the gospel. Turn to Christ. Turn away from living for Satan, self, and sin or whatever we might be living for. That's the gospel. I pray that today some will do so and come to Christ. Two, two implications and applications here. Uh, we must pray for one another and the gospel offers eternal hope. Now, in Sunday school, over many, many months, I've been teaching on what we call in theology means of grace. And one of the key passages is Acts 2.42. In Acts 2.42, you have there that they're, de excuse me, that they're devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread at prayer. Now, I looked at that word devoted, and that's a very good translation. It means... Uh, to be committed to something, to persevere in that which you're committed to and make that part of your life as you would serve God. So that's what the word of God or the apostles' teaching is to do. And this elsewhere in the New Testament is also used, same Greek word is used for prayer. As I'm reading Colossians and then Adam was talking about Ephesians and we think of the other epistles, it strikes me how important prayer is. And that the apostle himself in prison could be thinking about his own situation, is praying for a church that he never met. Does he believe that God answers prayer? Romans 12, 12. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Here's our devotion. Now, the prayer that we read about in the New Testament isn't what many mystics think of as their private devotions, although we certainly can pray in private. But this is prayer in the context of the body of Christ, prayer for one another, prayer for special needs and, and unique needs that members have, prayers for churches, prayers for those in authority. These are all prescribed in the New Covenant. Believing that God does answer prayer. Prayer that as much as possible we might live peaceably with all men. And I know many people have said, and I've heard it, Eric's heard it, well, if you believe that God's in charge of everything, why pray at all? Because it's all going to be the same anyhow. Well, I got a better way of stating that. If you believe that God's in charge of it, everything, then you really ought to pray to God. He's in authority. He can change things. He answers prayer. He gives us the privilege of going before the throne of grace, Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Oh, the thought of that is so wonderful. I think I mentioned, I don't know if it was in Sunday school or what, but I found a CD in the visor of my truck. And it has songs from about 10 years ago about the gospel and our status in Christ and what he's done for us. And one of them we sing on occasion before the throne of God above. 
I have a sure and certain hope. A great high priest whose name is love. Do you think that it, this is just Christian mythology, or do you think it's cold, sober truth? Do you really believe that Jesus Christ intercedes for us before the throne? Or is that just a quaint, romantic idea to make Christians feel better because they really don't have anything going for them anyhow? I believe it's the truth and how it can be that the one great high priest, Jesus Christ, could know every single believer by name and care about us and bring our needs before the very throne of God I believe it's true because, well, humanly, that maybe would not be possible, but we're not claiming Christ is only man. We're claiming he's also God and shares the attributes of deity. So who else could pray for us like that? It says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. When Paul prayed for the churches, he thanked God for them. It says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. It amazes me. Next week, I'm going to talk about this in more detail. God can and will use you and I. We're going to think about how God could take an ordinary person like Epaphras and use his testimony for a church to develop in Colossae. One person with the gospel. Do you know how powerful that is? In our last slide, Colossians 1.23, we're jumping ahead, we're doing a little preview here says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now, he didn't know them. He hadn't met them. But he's calling them to stay firm in the gospel. Remember, uh, just before I graduated from seminary and some battles with Royal had waged in the seminary, and Eric experienced this even worse than I did, but it went from gospel-centric in a, in a beautiful way to, well, some gospel and mostly human wisdom to human wisdom to emergent to postmodern to having no message at all by the time Eric was there. And as I was leaving the building a number of times, including when I was there with Eric, that's when I first met him, was to go talk to the dean about why the truth of the word wasn't taught. On the cornerstone of the building was this little excerpt from the book of Isaiah. And there it said, who will go? Who will go? Here I am, send me. Some previous generation of Christians wanted the young people that studied at that seminary to be equipped to go forth with the gospel and to answer the call of God. And I looked at that and I thought, is there anybody going to have a message that you'd even want to send out? Does anybody have a message that God could use to, to save the lost and to change lives? Or is this all just going to be human wisdom? Where did the gospel go? Where did the truth go? Where did the faith that at one time undergirded this institution, where did it go? Well, let's think about ourselves. If you continue in the faith, 
firmly established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The gospel offers eternal hope. I know one thing that for sure happened. The focus of so many became solving issues that they thought they saw out here in the world. This isn't fair and that isn't fair. And we're going to try to make the world a better place to live in. And we're going to raise everybody's social consciousness. Uh, Somebody asked me, well, what's that? Well, that's making sure you feel guilty for just being you. Okay, you're an ordinary person going about life. You ought to feel really guilty, you really bad person. Well, what did I do? You're a white Euro male. Always something you can't really repent of. But what about God's wrath against sin? Do we have, any, do we have a program for that? What about the forgiveness of sins? Do we have a program for that? What about sending people out with the actual gospel that will bring freedom from God's wrath and the forgiveness of sins? Do we have a program for that? Well, not really. So this is a warning to the flock, to us, to persevere in the gospel. The gospel is something we stay in. It's not some interesting starting point soon to be left behind. The eternal hope that we have in the gospel, the hope of the gospel, is never anything that we want to leave behind for any reason. So Paul in Romans 1 said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. My dear beloved brothers and sisters, I pray that none of us would be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I may not have the boldness is, that some have and the, art, the ability to articulate things. I can articulate pretty good, but I haven't yet figured out how to do it without a cough. But by the time you hear it on the Internet, the coughs will all be gone. And I believe God can use every one of us. Our witness is strong and powerful, and God is using it. So let's pray, and then we'll stand for the benediction. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul and his writing to the church at Colossae. Thank you for the power of the gospel and the clarity of thought that it brings to us. And we pray that in this day where so much confusion and compromise is all around, that our minds might be clearly focused on the truth of the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ. And may you grant us boldness and as we have eternal hope that we might share that with those around us. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand for the benediction, which today I shall read from Hebrews 13, and I'll begin with verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with all that is good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. Glory belongs to him forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.